Hello and welcome back to the second part of this O-Level Computer Science paper. This is paper one and it's from October, November 2023. So everybody, as you know, those people doing the O-Level are going to be sitting two papers. This is paper one, 50% um, of the final mark, 75 marks in total, one hour and 45 minutes for this paper. Okay, all questions compulsory. You are not allowed to use a calculator and this will be externally assessed. Paper two, weighted the same way and for the same marks. Okay, but paper one generally comes first in the exam calendar. Here we go. As I say, it's 2210 slash 12 for paper one. Okay, and it's from October, November. So let's get started. Okay, question eight. Draw and annotate a diagram that demonstrates a cybersecurity threat of data interception. Okay, data interception. Well, but basically, what that means is it's data that's been sent from one computer to another and it's been intercepted somehow so if i draw okay there's my computer and then another computer and then in between there we've got data being sent yeah and data you know comes in little packets from one computer to another so i want to put packets okay of data okay so packets of data this is user one and user two but then there's going to be some interception taking place yeah somebody's going to be trying to intercept that data basically it's a cybersecurity threat so how does that work well these packets that are being sent if i do this here i'm going to try and draw like a magnifying glass okay or like a tennis racket okay and this has been sent from like a third party computer and this is the hacker okay and the hacker is using this thing here which is called a packet sniffer okay a packet sniffer so we've got the hacker yeah and he's using a packet sniffer to sniff out the packets of data okay but why is he doing that he's trying to find useful data okay so user one packets of data yeah being sent from user one to user two the hacker has installed a packet sniffer to look at these packets to try and find if there's any useful data okay another name for this is eaves dropping okay so that's basically it user one transmission packets of data put in there the word transmission of packets of data okay user one user two a packet sniffer is used by a hacker eavesdropping to try and find useful information and that's how it works so that would give us hopefully four marks because that's what four marks is worth yeah for question eight and then but part B, identify one security solution that will help keep data safe from data interception and state why it will help keep the data safe. Yeah. Well, if we use, and you've all heard of this, encryption, yeah, would be my security solution. Encryption of the data, okay? Making any data on read unreadable encryption of the data making any data unreadable okay so that's what i would put there so i've just put that in there without so encryption of data making any data unreadable without a decryption key okay that would be my answer to part b now we've got some names to identify here i'm sorry i've written all over this so let's move it up a little bit question nine okay start at the top there let's have a little look the table contains terms and descriptions about the internet. Complete the table with the missing terms and the description. So the, for these first two, we just need a term. Okay, we've been given the description, but then for the bottom ones, or sorry, for these two, we need the description. And then for these two, again, we need the term. Okay, so let's start with the top two. The collective name of all the web pages available. Okay, so all the web pages that are available are on the what? Okay, or on something called the WWW or the World Wide Web. Okay, a small text file stored by a web browser that can store a user's personal data. Okay, a small text file stored on by the web browser that can store a user's personal data. This would be a cookie. Okay, now then, here's where we get descriptions the uniform resource locator or the URL. What is an URL? It is, it's basically, rather than the number, it's a text-based address of a website, okay? And it contains, usually, 
protocol, domain name, and file name, or folder. Okay, so that's that one. Text-based address of a website contains protocol domain name and file name. Okay, now not left a lot of room for the web server. Basically, web server stores and returns requested web pages. Okay, so web server, let's put a line there. Web server stores and returns requested web pages. Okay, the next two, let's just scroll up a little bit. The language used to create a website. Example tags are head and body. Well, this is obviously HTML. And I'm just going to put in there hypertext markup language. Okay, a protocol that is used to request and send web pages would be HT, HTTP. Hypertext transfer protocol, which stands for hyper, again, hypertext. Hypertext, hypertext transfer protocol. Okay, good. So that would get us the six marks there. Nice, easy six marks. Okay, we move on to question 10. We've got another big answer there. Six marks again in this one for part B. Um, but part A, nice and easy. Question 10, a business has a system that is described as having artificial intelligence. State one, one, state, on, state one for one mark, one of the main characteristics of an AI system. And I'm gonna put for this, it's got machine learning abilities, which simulate human behavior, okay? Machine learning abilities, which simulate human behavior. Okay, and then we've got a big question here, part B. An AI system is an expert system. Explain how an expert system operates. Okay, so the best idea, I think, would be to try and break this down again into some kind of, sort of bullet points. But I'm going to give you a little bit of an introduction. So an AI system is an expert system. Explain how an expert system operates. Well, it's an AI program. It emulates the decision-making of a human expert. Okay, so that's what it does. Explain how it is. So that's, that's, what it's, that's, the, that's the aim of it. It emulates the decision-making of a human expert. Its features include a knowledge base. But what's a knowledge base? It contains facts and rules, information. It has something called an inference engine, okay? And this applies logical rules to the knowledge base to derive conclusions. So it applies logical rules to the knowledge base to derive conclusions, okay? So it's got a knowledge base, it's got an inference engine, but how does the user talk to it? It obviously needs some kind of a user interface. Okay, and what does that do? Allows user to talk to and ask questions to the system. So it's got a user interface, and this allows users to talk and uh, ask questions to the system. It also has something called an ACK, how do you spell this? An acquisition module, okay? And what does this do? Allows for updating of the, okay? So this is an acquisition module as well. So it's got an acquisition module, which allows for updates um, of the knowledge base, okay? Because obviously the knowledge base will, um, if you've ever bought the um, board game Trivial Pursuit, in the 1990s, you'll realize that 30 years on, sometimes the questions might be a little bit out of date. And finally, I wanted to put, applies a rule base to the knowledge base to return results, solutions, other outputs, okay? So, to go back, and I think I've gone a little bit overboard with this, explain how an expert system operates. It emulates the decision-making of a human expert. Its features include knowledge base, it contains facts and rules, an inference engine, it applies logical rules to the knowledge base to receive conclusions. A user interface allows users to talk to and question the system. An acquisition module, which allows for updating of the knowledge base and applies a rule base to the knowledge base to return results, solutions, um, and other outputs, okay? So yeah, so that would be it for at least six marks, okay? Question 11, a manufacturing company uses an automated system in its manufacturing process. The automated system uses a flow sensor. Identify what a flow sensor measures. Well, I'm gonna draw a picture. I mean, let's let's recolor this. If we've got flow, it could be gas, it could be water, and we've got maybe a sensor here which measures the flow of the water, okay? Or gas measures, so identify what a flow measure, measures the flow of liquid or gas basically moving through an area. Now that just could be a pipe, like so. It could be a river, but it's basically, it's measuring the flow 
okay, either a liquid or a gas. Okay, so that would be give us one mark. Explain one advantage to employees of using an automated system in manufacturing. So one advantage, employees. Because part C, explain one disadvantage to the company owner, okay, of a business of using an automated system in manufacturing. So we're looking at the advantages and disadvantages, but at two different perspectives, the employee's perspective and the company owner's perspective. Okay, so one advantage to employees. Well, I would say in terms, and this, this always comes up, I would go safety, safety, okay? And then for this one, I'd put cost. Okay, so why safety, first of all? Okay, so safety. Employees do not need to do unsafe tasks or go into unsafe areas in the workplace. That's what I'd be tempted to say. Employees do not need to do unsafe tasks or go into unsafe areas in the workplace. Okay, that would be my number one thing. You could put down things like repetitive tasks. Employees don't need to do the sort of piece work um, where they're just maybe putting screws into plastic bags, counting screws into plastic bags over and over again, or screwing tops on bottles. Some people might like doing, doing that, but we don't need to worry about that. My, the key point I would say here is safety. And in terms of cost, okay, explain one disadvantage to the company owner of using an automated system in manufacturing. Cost, potential, it's not always, potential high setup cost to buy. Okay, so cost, potential high setup cost to buy the new technologies um, and train employees how to use and maintain. Okay. So that's what I would do. Potential high setup cost to buy the new technologies and train employees how to use and maintain. I think that would easily give us two marks for each of those sections. Okay, then we move on to question 12 where we change the topic entirely. We then move on to question 12. We then move on to question 12 where we change the topic entirely. Digital currency can be used to pay for products and services. Digital currencies are often tracked using digital ledgers. Give two other features of a digital currency. Okay, it's not fiat currency. Basically, it's not, it's not tangible. You, you, you can't hold it. It lives on a computer. It only is available electronic Kelly. Okay. E dot G Apple Pay or PayPal. Okay. It only don't get this mixed up with cryptocurrency because it's not. It's just basically currency that is digital. Yeah. We pay for things via credit card. Okay. It lives, it's digital. And you could argue, uh, you we could talk about centralized, decentralized systems, okay, depending on what we're talking about in terms of obviously cryptocurrency, which is a form of digital currency. But then if it's something like Apple Pay or PayPal, it is still linked to a central banking system. So I'm going to put can, and this is, uh, <laughs> this is, you win both ways here, can be decentralized, okay, e.g. Bitcoin. Okay, give two other features of digital currency. It only is available electronically, e.g. Apple Pay or PayPal, can be decentralized, e.g. Bitcoin. Okay, identify the process that uses a digital ledger to track the use of digital currency. Well, I'm sure you've all heard of this. It would be something called blockchain. Something called blockchain. Identify the process 
that uses a digital ledger to track the use of digital currency, the answer would be blockchain. Okay, and there are our three marks for digital currency. Let's have a look at the next bit. Question 13. Ah, oh, simple one mark answer. Storage and memory are important components of a computer system. Primary storage is one type of storage in a computer system. Tick one box to show which is an example of primary storage. Okay, well, A is portable. A CD is a portable storage. The hard disk drive and the solid state drive are classed as secondary storage systems. Okay, so the one left out is RAM. RAM is primary memory. Okay, primary memory. Okay, give one characteristic of primary storage. Well, this is a little bit like the um, what we've just done with uh, in terms of decentralized and centralized currency. Uh, primary storage, be it RAM or, or ROM, is either volatile or non non volatile. Excuse my writing there. Volatile and non volatile storage. Okay, you could put connected to the CPU as well. So part B, we've got some missing words here, have we? Is it a big, th quite a big thing? Look, okay. I'll read it to you, then we'll scroll where we need to be. Virtual memory has been created in a computer system, but why? Complete the description about virtual memory. Use the terms from the list. Some of the terms in the list will not be used. Some terms may be used more than once. Okay. So let's have a look. Move it right down. Okay, so got binary, um, our disk drive, hexadecimal, operating system, pages, random access memory, RAM, read-only memory, ROM, sectors, software, tracks, and virtual memory. Oh, my word. Lots of things linked to memory, then let's throw in binary and hexadecimal. Virtual memory is used when this something is full. Well, that's memory, but which type of memory? Well, it's, that's going to be RAM memory, random, random access memory. Okay. So we've done that one, but it might be used again. Created by partitioning the, well, that links to this one, the HDD, okay, hard disk drive. Okay, data is divided into, and this is what I'm sure I've seen that somewhere. Data is divided into, now, it's tricky on this, because we've got sectors and we've got tracks, which are linked to this, sorry, linked to this, the HDD, but it's actually, and this is, only appears very briefly in the book, it's something called pages, okay? Data is divided into pages, okay? That can be sent from, and this is, hang on, can be sent from, we must, we must be going back on ourselves. This is exactly the same. So going from RAM, going from RAM to the HDD, hard disk drive, okay? So yeah, bizarre. So virtual memory is used and it's worth five marks. That's the one that's gonna throw people pages. It threw me, must be honest, yeah? The hard disk is divided into these things, but it's the data. This is what you've got to look at. The hard disk drive is divided into sectors and tracks. Yeah, okay, we get that. But it's the data, okay? What is the data divided up in? Well, data is generally divided into packets if it's used for sending from one thing we're sending from from one device to another but this isn't this is internal this is go, this is going from from ram memory into onto the hard disk drive okay and we're sort of linking the two together in terms of virtual memory so okay it would be pages yeah a little tricky on that one but yeah and the fact that they've used the same thing twice so virtual memory is used when the random access memory is full it is created by partitioning yeah into tracks and sectors the hard disk drive Data is divided into pages that can be sent from RAM to the hard disk drive. Right, that's part B for five marks. Ladies and gentlemen, I do believe that is the end of the paper. So um, if you've stuck with me till the very, very end, thank you very much indeed. If you haven't watched part one of this video, um, that is available to you as well. So I'll put a link at the very end. Thank you very much indeed for watching and I will see you next time for a paper two, okay? Thank you very much indeed. Bye for now. Please continue to ask questions, leave your comments, hit notifications, and please subscribe. And finally, if you wish to buy me a coffee, I'd be truly grateful. Please visit buymeacoffee.com forward slash learning zone. Thank you very much indeed. See you next time. Bye for now.